Good evening, church. Praise God and thanks for being here again this week with us. I don't know about you guys, but I am so energized after this past Easter weekend. <clears throat> no, it wasn't candy. I always get pumped up when I, knowing that Jesus died for my sins, that three days later, after he went to the tomb, the tomb was opened and he conquered sin and he conquered death so you and I could have eternal life. If you're not excited about that, you really should be. Well, welcome to week five of our sermon series on chapter two of the book of Romans. Chapter two, we're going to go into chapter three this week. Uh, but so far, the Apostle Paul, he's been kind of letting us have it with both barrels. And I don't know about you, but the last four weeks has caused a lot of prayer, a lot of deep reflection, and some, a severe desire to change some things that are in my life. You know, I preach these messages to me as much as I preach them to you. This week is no different. So I want to open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 3. Uh, we're going to start uh, right in chapter 3. And while you guys are going into chapter 3, uh, I want to tell you guys a quick story. Uh, some of you may know this, some of you may not. I used to be a competitive strongman. Uh, I love the competition. I love the feel of heavyweights in my hands. Uh, you know, honestly, it was thrilling to compete in front of crowds of people and do things that the average person just couldn't do. But I'll be honest with you. I was a pretty mediocre, I was an average strongman. This guy right here, whichever way it is, this guy. This guy, his name is Brian Shaw. Brian Shaw is the four-time world's strongest man. He was the athlete that I looked up to uh, because honestly, during the time that I was competing, he was the man. He was, he seemed to be this unbeatable force throughout Strongman. You know, and during my competition days, you know, I'm six feet tall. My competition weight was around 275 pounds. But Brian here, uh, Brian is 6'8 and 440 pounds of rock solid muscle. So in comparison, if I was standing next to Brian Shaw, you probably say, I looked really small. Even at 275, I would have looked really, really small. But let me ask you this. If you stood in your chair and you compared us, what do you think that that would do for your perspective? Not much, right? I'd still look uh, pretty small. I'd obviously be a lot shorter. He would dwarf me because obviously he's twice my size. But what about this? What if you were in an airplane, 30,000 feet in the air, Brian Shaw and I are standing here side by side, would you be able to tell the difference? Probably not. We probably both look like little ants on the ground. Now let's just say, let's say that Brian's height and my height represented our level of personal goodness based on the number of good things we did in our lives, okay? Now, th th there's no doubt that by every comparison from the people around us, that Brian would be literally be head and shoulders above me, and he would be head and shoulders better than me. But what if we didn't look at it from airplane view, but from the perfect view that God has sitting on the throne in heaven. Do you know how God would see us in comparison with each other? In our text today, in Romans chapter 3, Paul says that God would look at the two of us and our levels of human goodness and say, I don't see a difference. 
in the eyes of God, we're both the same in the same spiritual condition and in the same spiritual situation. Even though every person around us would say, but God, it's obvious that Brian Shaw's a better person. Just look how much more. Look at all the good things that he's done compared to the things that I've done. It's not even close. How can you say that they look the same in your eyes? Well, how is it that people determine that they're basically good? They measure themselves against the lives of others, and they always seem to find those that are truly worse than they are. Now, I know that I'm not a saint, but at least I'm not like him. Okay? At least I'm not like him. This is even true in prisons. We touched on this a week or so ago. Murderers and rapists, uh, all kinds of violent criminals in prison, they look down on child molesters and pedophiles. They look to seriously injure them, even kill them if they get a chance to. Why? Because they see themselves in a much better light. People tend to measure their own goodness measured up against the badness of other people. In our scripture today, Paul wants us to notice that none of us have the ability to accurately evaluate our own level of goodness or badness, let alone the goodness or badness of other people. Think about that for a minute. That's not our job. We don't sit on that throne. And we don't have the right vantage point or perspective to see anything accurately or judge anyone ever, ever fairly. But God has the ability. God has the ability to see us truly as we are. And it's not pretty. Next week, we'll see in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the grace of God, or the glory of God, rather, excuse me. God says we're all in the same spiritual condition. We're all in the same spiritual situation. We fall horribly short of his standard. He doesn't compare us to each other. He compares us to himself. God is saying that when he looks at us compared to him, we all look the same. In Romans 3, 9 through 20, Paul makes, he makes his final argument on the total depravity of humanity and mankind in a rather dramatic fashion. And Paul's really good at being dramatic. Paul brings everyone into the courtroom. Every single person is on trial in front of God, who is our judge and who is our jury. Let's read Romans 3, 9 through 20. And then what we'll do is we'll walk through the case of God versus mankind. Okay? Well, then, should we conclude that the Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. Obviously, the law applies to those 
to who is given. And its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. No one can be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply is there to show us how sinful we truly are. Now, when the church in Rome heard this section of Paul's letter, it was, they were sitting there reading it to them, and when, when they heard this section of Paul's letter, I can guarantee you that there were no amens. No, you tell them, brothers. More likely, there was stunned silence. And maybe a few muttered, oh my. And when we understand what Paul is saying here, we should feel the same way. Oh my! First of all, in the case of God versus mankind, we have the charge. Verse 9 and 10a, For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. The charge against every person, no matter how raunchy or religious they might appear to those around them, is before they come to Christ, they're under the power of sin. That literally means that every person is dominated by, ruled by, mastered by, and conquered by sin. And it's not just that we commit sin, we serve sin. Sin is our master and we are its slave. We're under its control. In other words, we can't not sin. Now, I don't know if that's proper English, but it's proper theology, so we're going to say it. In fact, we're sinners by birth. We're sinners by choice, and we're sinners by experience. We're slaves to sin. We can't not sin. That's being under sin's power. Well, that's just the really bad people, Pastor Chris, and they're the ones that don't know any better and can't control themselves. No, that's not true. There's none righteous. Not even one. Righteousness is the over, overarching theme of the book of Romans. It's how to get right and how to be right with God. It's how to be acceptable in the eyes of God. We learn right from the start that when it comes to people in and of themselves, none are righteous. There are none that are right with God, none that are just, none that are good. And just in case some of you legalistic religious people are thinking, well, except for me, the Holy Spirit says, no, not even you, not one. Four times, no one is used. Three times, all is used. Who is righteous? No one. Who understands? No one. Who seeks after God? No one. Who is good? No one. Who is under sin? All. Who has turned away? All. Who is guilty before God? All. In a single paragraph, you have four no ones and three alls. That's seven. And seven in scripture is the, comp the, the number of completeness and totality 
This is God's complete indictment of mankind. How many people were righteous? None. Zip. Zero. Zilch. Nada. The big goose egg. Zero. And how many were guilty? All. All? Yeah. All were guilty. Now, some would say, you know, Pastor Chris, isn't it true, though, that people do good things sometimes? I mean, everything can't be bad. Everything can't be evil. That's true. There's a relative human goodness in the world. In other words, we're, we're not as bad as we could be. And we're not as bad as some others that we measure ourselves up against. But that's in human terms. And the reason for the relative goodness is because of God's goodness. God provided enough common grace throughout the world to make people good to some degree on a human level. Now this might get a little bit confusing I'm going to give you guys some, some theology here. This might get a little bit confusing, so ready? Here we go. Some theologians, they like to call this type of human goodness the bad good. Bad good. In other words, it's bad people doing good. But it's not the good good. It's bad good. It's the kind of bad kind of good. So far, so good? You with me? All right. Because the motive is something, the motive of that they're doing the good is something less than the glory of God, so it can't be good. No one does good good for purely selfless reasons, which is to magnify the glory of God. No one does good good without selfish motives. Did you get all that? Isn't theology fun? In the pre-flood civilization, God said he was going to drown the whole world because all he ever saw was evil in the heart of man. Does that mean that no one ever did anything good? Does that mean that no parent ever loved their children? Does it mean that no one ever helped their neighbor when they struggled? Does that mean there was no kindness ever back in the day? No, that's not what God's talking about here. That's not what he means at all. It just means that no one who did good did it with a perfectly pure heart or with a God-honoring motive behind it. There was no good good. No one was living up to God's standard. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. In a depraved, Christless, Christless state, we're all the same. We're all the same, church. When, when we don't have Jesus, we're all the same. We're conquered and we're controlled by sin. Even when we do things that appear to be good, we're tainted by a sinful nature. So when it comes to the charge against every person, everywhere, 
for all time, here's the bottom line. Every person is undeniably unrighteous and fully worthy of divine punishment. Yeah. That's the charge brought against every person everywhere for all time. Jew or Gentile, man or woman, religious or raunchy, every single person is guilty of unrighteousness before God and we deserve to pay the penalty for our sins forever. Aren't you glad you tuned in today? Aren't I a bright ray of sunshine? It gets worse before it gets better. Stick with me, though. Secondly, in the case of God versus mankind, we have the evidence. Now, I wish I could say that this was a a baseless charge and there was no proof of evidence to support God's case but it's there in verse 10 said Paul says it is written and every time somebody in in the in the bible says it is written somebody's about to hear, get an earful of something so Paul says it is written, and then he starts quoting Old Testament scripture. It's, it's a, as if Paul puts God on the witness stand himself to share all the evidence found to prove how guilty man is. The, the Jews prided themselves in knowing the scriptures, and Paul said, it's been there all along. You missed it. He goes on to quote a pile of verses, mainly from Psalms and Isaiah. And he does that to show the evidence of man's guilt. The evidence can be divided into four, one, two, three, four, four categories. God gives internal proof. Verse 10 says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. The New Testament says that the natural man doesn't understand the things of God. To him, they're foolishness. He doesn't understand spiritual things. He doesn't understand God and his perfect holiness. Why? His mind is dark because his heart is hard. Ephesians 4.18 says they darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. They can't understand God's truth because they can't know God. They're spiritually blind, spiritually deaf. They're ever learning, but they never come to a knowledge of the truth. Verse 11, there's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. Now, the idea of worthless here is kind of like milk that has gone sour. Have you ever taken a big swig of milk? And then realized it's gone bad? What do you do? Spit it out, probably throw up, and then you dump the rest of the milk down the drain. So, the condition of Jesus, the, I'm sorry, the condition of every heart that's apart from Jesus is very, very similar. God says we all have rotten hearts and we have rotten minds. Like salt without its flavor or fruit that got rotten, it doesn't have value. It's not good for anything. Verse 12, there's no one who does good, not even one. Now, do you remember in English class when 
they, for me, that was a very long time ago, but I remember in English class, uh, they told us don't never use double negatives. In English, double negatives cancel each other out, but in Greek, it's very different. In Greek, a double negative intensifies what's being said. So here, Paul's using a triple negative. Triple negative. That's like saying, don't not never. Don't not never. It's three times as strong. He says, there is not never, no never, one person who has ever really done good. That's what he's saying. That's how sinful we appear before God. Now, second, God gives us verbal proof. Romans 3, 13 and 14, their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit, the poison of vipers is on their lips, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Paul again here quotes Old Testament verses that identify four parts of the body that have to do with speech. Throat, tongues, lips, and mouths. And he says they're all jacked up. They're all tainted. Is it any wonder that in Proverbs 6, when God mentions thick, six things that he hates, three of the six actually have to do with what people say? Verse 13a, their throats are open graves. That's a pretty ugly picture, isn't it? To ancient Jews, there was nothing grosser than an open grave. With decaying bodies in it. Zombies! No, just kidding. No zombies. Just kidding. But seriously, the ancient Jews thought the open grave was just the most hideous thing in the history of the world. And I remember Jesus called for Lazarus' tomb to be opened, and Martha was like, oh, no, 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 Jesus... You want to do that? Um, he's been dead for four days, and that's nasty. He gonna smell. Don't just just leave 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 it closed. God says that the stench of a man's words are like rotting, stinking, decaying flesh. What's the root of the problem? Jesus says in Matthew twelve thirty four, for the mouth speaks with the heart is full of. Simply put, a dead spiritual heart produces dead, stinking words. Listen, if you've got bad breath, you take some Listerine, here's the problem. But there isn't a mouthwash in the world that's going to take away the stench of rotten words. And when they come out of a sinful heart, there's no amount of Listerine that's going to clean up a heart. Verse 13b, their tongues practice deceit. Think of deceit like a fish hook. The fish hook needs the deception of the bait to cover it up. And while the fish is thinking, hmm, lunch, the fisherman is thinking, hmm, dinner, when he's trying to deceive the fish. The fisherman's got bad intentions for that fish. And he's, he says that people use their words like a fisherman uses bait to cover the fish hook. They use it to deceive and to manipulate and to get what they want. We've seen that recently, right? Whether it's about the pandemic or racial division, maybe political games. Verbal deceits everywhere right now in this day and age. Verse 14a, the poison of vipers is on their lips. Man's words aren't just nasty, they're poisonous. They don't just smell like death, they're deadly. They can kill like the bite of a poisonous snake. Now hear me out. How many friendships have been killed over words? How many marriages have died over words? 
how many wars among nations have been fought over words. See what I mean? Verse 14b, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Now we live in a vulgar and profane world. Don't we? Honestly, it just blows my mind sometimes the language that comes out of some people's mouths. You know, when I was little, we didn't watch a whole lot of TV. Uh, we got, my brother and I got like an hour of Scooby-Doo in the morning while we were eating our Fruity Pebbles. Uh, and then it was go out and play, come back when it's dark. But when we did watch TV, we mostly watched TV as a family. And there was one rule. If any cuss words came out, the TV got turned off. We were done. Nowadays, you probably can't watch a show to completion without hearing some kind of a cuss word or at least the belief that it was supposed to be covering it up. Even Disney couldn't keep it clean. You know, you remember the final line that Rhett Butler said in Gone with the Wind? Frankly, my dear, I don't... Well, you know what he didn't say. You know what he didn't do. You get the point. People were outraged at Disney at that time. Um, but we've come a long way. And unfortunately, it was a long, a wrong way. It was a bleh. It was a long way in the wrong direction. We've almost become desensitized. We've become vulgar and profane. And the Bible tells us that sinful minds produce sinful mouths. God gives us practical proof. Verse 15 and 16. Their feet were swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery marked their ways. And the ways of peace they do not know. I like that version of that. The world's never been more advanced techno technologically. And we've never been more backwardly moral than we are today. Changed my mind on that. We think we're advancing, that we're moving forward. We think we're getting better and we're getting better. But God says, God says where violence and bloodshed are everywhere, that's proof of the opposite. You want to hear a staggering statistic? Dr. Alan Barnett, an MIT statistician, says, since 1990, in America, an unborn child has a greater statistical probability of being murdered in the womb than did an American soldier who left for World War II. That's unbelievable. Should we, as followers of Christ, put our heads in our hands and say, what's the use? No, absolutely not. But we need to know that we're never going to find complete peace until Jesus comes back. We're always going to have those things. Finally, there's spiritual proof. And this is the motive that drives it all. Romans 3, 15 through 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's not the totality of wisdom. It's just the start. It's where you begin. It's wise to have a, a healthy fear of God. Why? Because it's going to help you say no to some sinful things that you really want to do and say yes to. Proverbs 16 and 6 says, And by fear of the Lord one departs from evil. Do you know why I didn't do more ornery and, and disobedient and let's just call them what they are, sinful things when I was growing up? I had a healthy fear of my parents. If I did stupid stuff, I had to go answer to my mom and dad. And let's face it, that was never fun. That healthy fear made me reevaluate and made me rethink some of the plans that I'd had that I really thought I wanted to do. 
And honestly, I'm thankful for that. It saved me a lot of heartache and a lot of trouble. And over time, my healthy fear that I had of my parents faded. And I realized that they weren't trying to keep me from having fun. They were trying to keep me alive because I was a hot mess back then. They were trying to point me in the right direction. My fear of them grew into a healthy respect and appreciation and admiration for them. They wanted what was best for me. And they were willing to bring a little necessary pain into my life to stoke the fires of a healthy fear. Did they enjoy it? Maybe a little, but I doubt it. But they knew what I needed. Wisdom begins with a healthy fear of God. And as you're growing and understanding who God is and who he is, who he, he wants you in his life. That fear keeps you from doing the things that you want to do that you know aren't that good. And the things that you used to do, but you don't get down like that anymore because you know God doesn't play like that. He said there would be consequences, and you believe him. Universally, mankind doesn't fear God. They don't honor him. They don't respect him. And when there's no fear of God, no fear of his power, no fear of the consequences of disobedience, no fear of his judgment, there is a growing, unbridled appetite for sin. And it can't be stopped, and it's never going to be satisfied. That's the picture of the human heart without Jesus Christ. It's practical atheism. They may say they believe in God, but they live like he doesn't exist. We're known by our fruit, church. We're known by our fruit. The evidence of, their, of our lives shows it. Thirdly, in the case of God versus mankind, we've got the defense. In every trial, there's a, there's a defense. And up until this point, we've had nothing but prosecution in this case, right? Now it's time for the defense to speak. Verse 19a says, Now we know whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced. So the judge calls for the defense. And what do they say? Nothing. Crickets. The reason there is no defense, is there is no defense. There's no excuse and no escape. There will be no one who can point to the law and say to God, I didn't know. There's not going to be one person who can make an acceptable excuse to God. Not one. God didn't give the law to save anyone. He gave us the law to condemn everyone. Let's face it. We can't perfectly keep the Ten Commandments. What makes us think that we're going to be able to uphold the whole law? The point of the law is to show us a desperate need for a Messiah whom, whom God sent and who could and would save us from our sin and from ourselves. The point of the law is to make us realize that we're hopeless and we're helpless and we're sinners. And without that grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, we're doomed. We're hopeless failures. And we've got no defense for our actions. None. 
You know, it's interesting to me in Revelations 8, uh, when the seventh seal is about to be opened and God levels this incredible judgment on the guilty earth, it says there was silence in heaven. Revelations 8 and 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. This was mankind's opportunity to object, church. I object, Your Honor. There's got to be someone with something that can save us from your wrath. This is when people get the opportunity to say, I didn't need you to send your son to die for me because look how perfect I am. Look how holy and righteous I was. He didn't need to be my substitute. I did just fine without him. But nothing. Crickets. They know they're guilty, and they've got nothing to say. The evidence is stacked against them, and the case is airtight. Lastly, the trial bet between God and and mankind, we have the verdict. Romans 3, 19b through 20 says, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world can be held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. In other words, verdict's in. We're all guilty as charged. The Bible says it's terrifying to fall into the hands of an angry God. Listen. When a person doesn't truly understand their pitiful, terrifying predicament as a guilty sinner with no hope of escape, they'll never understand the glory of the gospel. The Gospels are only hope. That's why in verse 21, verse 21 is so sweet and so exhilarating when it begins, but now. The first step of the good news of God is the bad news of mankind's condition. We're guilty, but now. It's when a person realizes their condition and situation apart from Christ that the good news becomes great news. And I'll explain that to you next week. I was reading an article, and it was about this guy in Ontario, Canada. He gets arrested for armed robbery. Um, so he, he gets arrested. He goes to jail. The police officer, this guy named John Bolton, uh, he notices around the, you know, the prisoner's neck He's wearing a cross. And that piqued his interest because he knew the prisoner. He, he wasn't a religious man at all. But there he was, wearing a cross. So the officer, he asked to see the cross. And he, so he looked it over carefully and he notices that there, at the top of the cross, there's this little protrusion. So he asks the prisoner, What's the little protrusion about? And he's like, oh, no, no, it's nothing. It's just the way that it was made, and don't even worry about it. It's nothing. But the officer wasn't convinced, so he sent it out to a specialist to have him take a look at it. And the specialist, the specialist discovers that the little protrusion from the top of the cross could unlock most sets of handcuffs anywhere in the world. Eventually, it was discovered that many of the prisoners in that same facility were making keys that looked like crosses. You could say that the cross was their key to freedom? No, bad dad joke, my bad. But th that's the truth, though. And it's the same for each of us. It's the cross of Jesus that sets men and women free. The cross sets them free from the guilt they have piled up and the punishment they deserve. Is the cross the key to liberty? 
Well, we're going to talk about that next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this message today. And thank you for all of those who are listening to it. Thank you that even though the evidence against us is massive, that you made a way for us to go free. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to be our advocate. Without him, we're nothing, because he's everything. I ask you, Lord, that you continue to convict us with your righteousness and with your holiness. Help us to become closer to your standard each and every day. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for coming and hanging out with me for another week. Appreciate you coming into the living room. We here at Victory Biker Church want to invite you to come each and every week. Uh, we also want to invite you to uh, our pit stop Bible study. Uh, that starts this Tuesday uh, here, 32 Hicks Road in Augusta, Maine. Uh, it's going to be from 6 to 7.30. So come, drink some of my coffee. We're going to start, we're going to start studying the book of James. Um, so come with us, have fun. But until next week, be blessed.